Would you believe me if I told you I've built my own fusion reactor at home? Probably not, so I've made this video to prove it. Sort of. Hello everyone and welcome to the lab, where today we're going to be taking a look at this, my latest and greatest creation, a Farnsworth Harshmeeks fusion reactor. It's a type of ionic proof of concept fusion reactor and we'll go into a little bit more detail about what that actually means in a moment. But first, a little bit of history on this project. I actually started this all the way back in 2013, um, so a long time ago about five years now, and the reason I decided to do this project was because I just finished the first Tesla coil and it was a great success, I really enjoyed it, and I wanted to move on to something new, something different. I saw this project online, I saw one of the Geek Group videos about it, and I thought, you know what, this is uh, pretty easy to do at home actually, it's not too expensive, and it has a pretty cool uh, effect that it creates, just like a Tesla coil, so I thought, why not give, a go, give it a go at making one of those. Um, however, we bought most of the parts, I assembled it, and we hit a few problems because mainly the vacuum pump wasn't strong enough to run the system, and again I'll go to what this actually does in a moment. Um, so the vacuum pump wasn't powerful enough, which completely stopped work on the project entirely because we couldn't move any further forward. So that's a bit of an issue because these are pretty expensive, uh, it's the most expensive part of the entire project and we just bought it and it was just not good enough. So I didn't really feel like spending even more money on another one, especially because I didn't have the funds at the time, so I just put the project on hold and basically said I'll come back to it at a later date when I have the time and when I have the money to complete it. And would you know, that's five years afterwards. Um, mainly because all sorts of other things came up in between that time, for instance, Project Exodus, the 2400 watt DC resonant charging bipolar Tesla coil project. That was absolutely massive, that took all of our time and resources. And of course, we crowdfunded that, so funding wasn't an issue there. And then after Exodus, various other things took my time, i.e. college and things. But of course, this, the lab, the lab project, getting this built and off the ground. Um, you can see all the lab build videos on that, uploaded previously. Um, it's been a year since the lab build started and it's pretty much finished. I've spent this summer furnishing the lab and um, getting everything finished off and of course doing the project. So only now have I really got the time to sit down and say, well, let's finish this because I started it. I built all the, the wooden structure for it and everything. Most of the circuitry was done. So it was a bit of a shame just to sort of leave it. So I thought, you know what, before I do any other projects really, any other big ones at least, I'll get this done, get this finished. Um, ideally, I wanted to have it done a few months ago so I could spend the summer doing other projects, but it's just the way things happened. But anyway, it's done after five years, finally. I'm really happy with it, I'm happy with the results, and you'll see in a moment what it looks like. It does look pretty cool, even if you don't understand any of what this actually does and any of the technology and the science behind it. But anyway, so let's get into what this actually is. So a Farnsworth Fuser is a very basic, simple prototype fusion reactor. Now, it doesn't actually work in the sense of generating power. It does work, but it doesn't generate power efficiently, which is why they're not built and constructed widely around the world. It's well known that fusion is its possible, but it's not economically viable. It doesn't produce more energy than it consumes, which means there's no point building them. Until that problem is solved, um, these can't be mass produced or anything. And when that problem is solved, the world's power problems will be no more because fusion energy could pretty much provide enough power to run you know, the entire world forever. So um, that's a good business opportunity there if someone solves that problem. But this, this is still a fusion reactor, it just doesn't produce energy economically at all. This one in particular doesn't produce any energy at all, it's purely for aesthetics and visuals because it does produce a nice effect. Now the system itself is actually really straightforward. We have a vacuum chamber here which is just a glass jar, and it's connected to this vacuum pump, which is a uh, 4.5 cubic feet per minute rotary vane two-stage vacuum pump with vacuum gauge. 
connected to the chamber and that sucks all the air out so it's not a perfect vacuum but a pretty good vacuum. Inside this box we have a high voltage source and then on the front panel we just have controllers for controlling the power going to the high voltage source and monitoring screens. And then the high voltage is applied to the inside of the chamber and I'll explain more details on how that works in a moment and you get ion plasma forming around here which glows blue and purple and it looks really cool. So that's the basic rundown of the system. It's actually quite straightforward, it's not too complicated. To be honest I'd say Tesla coil is more complicated in theory of operation. But let's go to the whiteboards and just briefly discuss the actual physics behind this and how this works because it's not too complicated and it is pretty interesting. The theory of operation of a Farnsworth fuser is actually straightforward and works on a principle known as inertial electrostatic confinement. Here we have the vacuum chamber and inside it we have two electrodes which we're calling grids because they're in a grid formation rather than like a plate. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. We have an inner grid and we have an outer grid. The outer grid is simply connected to earth ground. The inner grid is connected to our high voltage source which I mentioned a moment ago. And it's really straightforward, we just have 240 volts, 50 hertz coming in to a step-up transformer. In this case I'm using a microwave oven transformer. So we get 2000 volts AC out. However, we need a negative voltage. We need a negative charge for the center electrode, this inner electrode. So what we have is a diode put in this direction. This basically creates a half wave rectifier, which rectifies the waveform so only the negative portion gets through. As you can see up there, you go from your normal sine wave just to the negative side. And then the other side of the transformer is simply put to ground as well. Now what you have here in this, inside this vacuum chamber is a very high potential between the inner and outer electrodes. And of course, because you have the potential difference there, the remaining air molecules inside the chamber get ionized. Now this is important to know, the vacuum is not perfect. I mean, it's impossible to create a perfect vacuum, but this is nowhere near perfect. So there are still many air molecules inside the chamber, but a very small number. And that's important, I'll explain why in a moment as well. So what happens is the remaining air molecules ionize, which means they lose their electrons and they gain a positive charge. Now, you have positive ions floating around inside this chamber and you have a great big negative charge in the center. So what's going to happen? Obviously, the positive ions are going to be attracted to the center electrode. Now this is where the fact that they're grids become important. This center electrode is a grid, it's a, a series of metal rings, rather than a point. And that's important because when the positive ions are attracted towards the center, what happens is, instead of them colliding with the center electrode, the idea is that they pass through the grids. And when they pass through the grids, there is a high probability that the ions will actually collide with each other. And actually a small minority of them will collide head on with such a force and such momentum that they will fuse together. And that's where the fusion reaction comes from. Now of course, you need a lot of energy, which is why you need a high voltage. And you need to make sure that this is a vacuum, because if there are too many air molecules inside there, then the ions are just going to collide with each other all over the place and they'll never reach the center. So you need to get the right balance of having just a few remaining air, po air molecules inside, hence it's mostly a vacuum, but not too many or too little that they, there's no fusion reaction or they collide with each other. Now the original design for this made by um, Kilo T. Farnsworth, uh, who was actually the inventor of the television, just fun fact there, designed this to have electron guns instead of grids, instead of these electrodes around the outside and the, the inside. Electron guns being the same thing they use in old cathode ray TVs, to uh, fire electrons at the phosphorus screen to light up little pixels and that's how you see the image. Um, then Meeks and Hirsch arrived and changed the design a bit with these grids, which makes it better and more efficient and definitely easier to construct. But there you go, that's pretty much it. It's really simple. You just have a high voltage, get a negative charge and a potential difference between the two grids, make the chamber a vacuum so the air, po the air molecules don't collide with each other, they'll be attracted towards the center and fuse. Now, one thing I need to stress is that this is what's known as a demo fuser. It is simply a proof of concept. So the actual rate of fusion happening here is next to zero, it's negligible, okay? There's just, the system's too small, there's not actually enough energy being inputted to even create much fusion reaction at all. The second reason is because there's no actual fuel in here. 
in an actual Farnsworth fuser or Farnsworth Hashimoto fuser, you wouldn't use the air molecules. You would actually put in deuterium, or even more ideally, tritium, which are both isotopes of hydrogen. Now, of course, tritium is radioactive and hard, well, impossible to get hold of for obvious reasons. Deuterium you can get hold of, um, and, you, and I can upgrade this to an actual working fusion system, but I'll explain why I won't be doing that, or probably won't be doing that in a moment. Now what's impressive about this project is that you can actually see the reaction taking place, which is why it's interesting. Because when the voltage builds up and when the ions collide in the centre, you get these uh, ions and the electrons in the ions exciting and then de-exciting, which is going to emit light in the form of visible light, which you can all see. And so this plasma, these ions that form around the outside and the inside of this grid, glow blue and purple, and it looks really cool because it's a bit different to a Tesla coil where you have you know, a beam of lightning, uh, an arc, an electrical arc or spark, whereas here you just have a, this purple glow coming from the centre and it looks pretty cool. And you can, of course we can change the intensity of the glow by increasing or decreasing the power to the system. Now, the reason I don't want to upgrade this to a fully working fusion system is because, for a start, if I want to put deuterium in there, deuterium is quite expensive and hard to get hold of, but even if I did put it inside here, you would actually be getting so much fusion that you would be emitting enough neutrons that it becomes dangerous. You would be producing quite a fair bit of radiation, and so the entire system has to be encased in stainless steel. Stainless steel vacuum chamber, stainless steel um, vacuum management systems, not to mention you would need a new gas management system for actually inputting the deuterium and you would need better uh, monitoring equipment for the pressure so you know the pressure of the vacuum and the pressure within the amount of deuterium you're actually putting inside it. On top of all of that, if you have an entire stainless steel cage around this thing, you're not even going to be able to see the reaction. So you'd either have to put lead glass, which is obviously more money, in, in the front of it, or you'd have to put some sort of system where you have a camera inside it and then power and signalling for that camera coming out of the chamber. And on top of all of that, you'd need some way to actually detect the neutrons to actually make sure the reaction is happening. And there's various ways of doing that, neutron detection equipment and what have you, but of course they're more money, more expensive. The final thing is that all of these systems would have to be bigger and better. So you'd have to have not only a bigger and better rotary vein vacuum pump, but you'd have to have another entire vacuum pump known as a diffusion pump to get this vacuum to even deeper level. You would need a much higher voltage in this system. This is just 2,000 volts. I think you want about 40,000 or something like that for a proper deuterium, uh, uh, proper deuterium fuser system. Um, again, it's the exact same principles. There is absolutely no fundamental difference between this and a proper fusion system that generates neutrons. But to get to that stage, it would cost a hell of a lot. It would be a lot of time. It would be a lot of work. You'd, be, you'd have to be machining stainless steel, metal, and everything. And it would also even take up a lot of space because the whole system would just be bigger. These components would all have to be, be able to handle higher currents and higher voltages, and so they would be bigger. Um, so it's just a lot of time, money, and effort. And as far as fusion is concerned, I'm happy with this project, I'm happy with how it is, I'm happy with how it's turned out. And to be honest, I don't really feel like investing that much time, effort, and especially funding. It would cost, I think, at least, I think the cheapest you could probably do it for a thousand pounds at least. Um, so I probably won't be doing that. I say probably because it is a possibility. Like I said, it's the same principles as this, just on a bigger scale. So I could, it could be something I do in the future, maybe a few years down the road, not now. I've got a big long list of other projects to get on with. So without further ado, I think it's time I'll show you the front panel and then we can actually turn this thing on and you can see the effect for yourself. So the entire operation of the fuser is controlled completely from this front panel. You have a voltage monitoring screen and a current monitoring screen controlled by these two switches. The system isn't on right now, so they won't turn on. And this is so you can monitor the amount of power going into the system. Over here, you have the switch that controls the pump and activates or deactivates the vacuum. This switch is the main power switch. When you flick that up, power will run to the fuser, so that's basically the on-off. And finally, you have the actual voltage control. So this is a 3 amp variac, which allows you to turn up the voltage and you'll be able to see the measurement on the screen to the desired effect, ensuring that you don't go too far because the system is only built for a certain power level. If you put too much power in, it will overload and break. And then once you're done, you turn it back down and then you would just shut it off like that. So here's a shot at the back of the system. We have the power lead here. 
Just one power lead powers the whole system from the vacuum pump to the high voltage to the control circuitry. Okay, then you can see we have the two screens and all the switches all wired into our power supply, which is just um, the inside of a little DC adap uh, AC adapter for DC power down here and the cabling just runs off to all of those. This here is the current transformer. This is what allows us to measure the current going through the system and that's connected to the current screen. This is the heart of it. It's the 2000 volt microwave oven transformer, MOT. That provides 2000 volts out of here, which goes through four microwave oven diodes in parallel. That's just because these get really hot when they run. So putting them in parallel allows the, the current to be spread out across them so they don't get that hot. And then this cable goes up towards the inner grid. The input to the microwave oven transformer goes through this variac, which you can't really see. It's mounted to this piece of wood. So, um, but that just sits right here and that's tied directly to the input. And there's a few terminal strips for connections and the relays. These black things are relays, which allow the low voltage lights uh, on the switches to control the the mains voltage going into the transformer and vice versa so it's it's pretty straightforward that's all there is to it the outer grid is just connected to ground through this ground wire which is also grounded to the secondary output of the transformer which is the case that's why it's connected here and that just goes to the ground of the plug and uh, this cable comes from the main supply and just runs up to the pump so the vacuum chamber is also pretty simple, but it was actually the most difficult part to build in terms of uh, an engineering point of view. You've got the inner grid there, which is just that metal ring, which is connected to a bolt, which goes down through this piece of metal, through the wood, and connected to the high voltage supply. Um, note that it's not connected to this piece of metal. This piece of metal it actually forms the second grid. This is ground, and you can see on the outside these metal wires going up all around isotropically. They're all connected to a wire which connects directly to the ground plate and this plate through the little screw here is connected to earth ground. Now the reason why this was so difficult to build was because this has to be airtight. This has to be very, a very, very good airtight seal. Um, so even when the pump's running, there's not air leaking back into the system. And this was notoriously difficult to do because no matter how hard I tried, getting these electrodes to go through and getting this feed through for the uh, the actual uh, the vacuum pump connection here was extremely hard to get through and to keep the airtight seal. Um, I've tried all sorts of methods, I've tried all sorts of contacts and connections and every single time there was a leak. I tried a million and one different types of glues and sealants and liquid cements. Um, but turns out the, the solution was these two uh, gland slash grommet type plastic systems for um, running cables into and out of cabinets. Um, and then I just put some loads of really tight rubber grommets and washers around the bolt and around the, the, um, the hose and then stuffed them inside these plastic connectors and then screwed them on really, really tight with a, a rubber washer that you can't see underneath the plastic. And that actually worked really well. Um, but it, that was about the fifth iteration. Um, so out of the entire system, that was the main thing that was uh, causing difficulties and caused me to actually remake this chamber several times. But um, that all works now, I'm happy with that. And this system can be completely taken apart. You just take these wing nuts off, take the bolts out, you can take the lid off. This system is designed actually, so when you tighten these wing nuts up, it clamps this piece of wood down onto this glass cylinder, clamping it into the metal, pushing it down, creating a nice seal. Um, but it's designed so you can just take it apart for maintenance. So you can take this, this glass jar right off, you can disconnect the grids and I can modify any of these systems if, if I need to for any reason. Um, so let's actually show you it running.
if you look really closely, you can actually see the grid moving, which I think is a pretty cool additional feature. And we can increase the intensity by turning the power up a little more. And then you can see the actual center of the, uh, the nut in the middle actually starts to glow as well. And you also notice the outer grid glowing slightly. And you'll see it occasionally spark as it arcs between the inner grid and the outer grid. And we can turn it down a bit. You can see that some of the rings start to completely deionize and just generally get dimmer. Turn it back up to full power. And it's not that loud either, compared to the Tesla coil anyway. And then we can turn the entire thing off with the switch. course I'll now show you it at night when it's in complete darkness and it looks the best.
And with that, we conclude this video showcase of my Farnsworth Harsh Meeks demo proof of concept ionic fusion reactor. I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, just a few notes before we finish though. This pump was bought on Purse.io using Bitcoin Cash, uh, a website where you can buy anything on Amazon for a maximum 33% off just if you use cryptocurrency. So I highly recommend that. Got this delivered really quickly, so uh, do check that out. Um, this is the first video in a long series of videos I'm going to be uploading for these next couple of days because I've been working very hard in the lab these past uh, couple of months over summer, um, working on six projects including this and they're all completely finished now, um, so I'm going to be documenting them, doing a ton of videos and uploading them, so watch out for those uh, this week and next week. Um, I hope you all enjoyed and uh, don't forget there's the blog posts if you want to have a look at pictures of the construction of all these projects which I don't show in these videos, the link is in the description. So thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!